Good afternoon, everybody. Before we start, because it's late, I like to play a small game with you. Very sorry for that, but we got to do all, that, all of that together. And for that game, can we please turn the light on? Perfect. So the game is called High Five Snake, and hopefully it's going to bring all the energy back and make us laugh just a bit. Game is very simple. We start over here. Each row, it's a competition between all the rows here. So um, the person sitting on the very left starts by giving the person next to him a high five. And then that person will forward the high five to the next person. Everybody watch out, there's a high five coming. You don't want to catch it with your face. <laughs> and then we'll see over there which row is the quickest. Quite easy, right? Um, and obviously, I do that once in a while to wake people up when it's late. And I'm Austrian. I live in Berlin now for 15 years. And the last time I've done that was in Berlin at the GoTo conference last year. How many Austrians are here? Hands up. OK. You know, as I said, Austrian, 15 years Berlin. You know what they say about Austrians, what they say about us? They say that sometimes we are a bit slow. <laughs> so can we? Kick their butts, big time. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna count three, two, one, zero, and on zero you start. Everybody sure who's sitting on the leftmost side here on that side? You continue. Yes, there is a bit of running involved because there is a gap here and over there. <laughs> so for some people there is mild physical exercise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ready? Three. Two, one, zero. Come on, come on, come on. Quicker, quicker, quicker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was finally the first row who won. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay. Thank you very much. Now let's start with On Death and Dying, Moving to Trunk-Based Development. And um, the title is not because this is in Vienna and um, Viennese people have this kind of special relationship with death and dying, which we do and we love our cemeteries and we love the catacombs and everything. But I'm going to go into why I'm co I called the, the talk um, that way in a second. Before that, let me just quickly introduce myself and my company. So my name is Matthias Hutter. I'm the head of platform engineering at OLX in our office in Berlin. Anybody has heard of OLX before? Astonishing many people. We are a quite a huge company. We operate in 40 countries, um, have over 5,000 people around the world, also 40 offices. And what we're doing basically is online classifieds. Um, if you think about like, is it like Craigslist or is it like Wilhaben.at? Exactly the same, different countries, not Austria, not Germany. But Poland, for example, um, we're quite big in terms of traffic. We're pretty much on level with Twitter, maybe a bit bigger. Um, the numbers are not very new, but um, they're, a bit, they're a bit outdated and we've been growing. But now that introduction aside, let's talk about um, why did they call the talk on death and dying? And it's coming from a title of a book that was written by Dr. Elisabeth Kübler-Ross. She's, she's Swiss, but uh, she was writing that at the University of Chicago in 1969. And basically, she was a psychologist researcher, and she was researching on people who heard terrible news about the fact that they would be dying very soon. And she, she found that there was a certain pattern of behavior, how people would um, deal with that information, how would they would process it and handle it. Um, very often, it's refer referred to as the stages of grief. Sometimes it's the five stages of grief. Sometimes it's the seven stages of grief or the nine stages of grief. doesn't really matter. It's stages of grief. Um, and interestingly, that um, model does not only apply to people being to told they are going to die, because if that was the case, and I'm here to talk about trunk-based development, <laughs> that would probably be a hard pitch, but um, this model actually also turns out to apply for any situation where we're faced with a change that was not initiated by us. Think about mobile phones hitting the market or smartphones coming up, or, you know, new change in the way the company works and we have to deal with it, anything like that. And using, doing trunk-based development brings a lot of change. So I want to tell you today a bit of a story about change. This is a story, not 
my personal story of how I did that or how my team did that in the past. But this is a story that basically represents at least three teams that I've seen doing exactly the same and going through the same phases and going through the same behaviors. So it re represents three teams that did the same, that did the same journey and faced the same problems. Um, this does not only apply to subversion. <laughs> so this is a version control strategy which does not only apply to subversion but also to Git or teams, uh, yeah, whatever, clear case if you're unfortunate enough to work with IBM. But use it, you can use it wherever, however, it's a standard term that got established somehow with trunk-based development. Now every story needs a hero, and where's that one here? Our heroes are the Dionysus team. There is Nora, who's the team lead, then there's Sifo, Julio, Andreas, and Fifi. And basically, they're a software de development team. And what exactly they do is left to your imagination. If you feel more towards a startup, they could be a software development team of a startup. If you have more of a corporate background, they could be a corporate team that works on a couple of microservices on a larger scale. It doesn't really matter. Um, but they develop software. And what they do to develop software is they're using the GitHub flow. So everybody who works, when he starts a new feature, he creates a fork of the repository. Makes it, commits its changes to that fork, then makes a pull request. That pull request gets reviewed by a colleague, by one of those five people, and then ultimately merged to master. They do release once a week, usually on Tuesdays. Um, and if you ask FiFi about how things are, she'd say, it's quite OK, yes. I mean, once in a while, there's rollbacks. Sometimes there's hot fixes. But in general, it's working, right? And soft, no software development ever is perfect. And this is where our story starts, at the monthly retrospective. And how monthly retrospectives happen, the last one was in January, because that's how it goes, right? We always say we do monthly retrospectives, but then business comes in and we forget to do them. So it's been a while, and things have been piling up. And uh, Julio feels like he has to shuffle too many things at once. There is feature development on one hand. There is code reviews he has to do for his coworkers, because otherwise they get blocked. There's QA findings that he needs to fix, and there's releases that also happen once a week. And all of that somehow distracts him and he has to juggle, up, juggle it through. Oopsie. No. Sorry. Then there is Sifu, who complains a lot about merge conflicts. He feels like every time he makes a pull request, it gets merged a bit too late. And then when he actually got the review working, the, 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 the branch doesn't merge anymore, and he has to resolve a conflict, and it's quite painful. And they find, because of both of these facts, there is a lot of bugs in production um, that just wouldn't need to be there if they could really focus on their work and not have to deal with those constant interruptions. Then there's Nora, who also feels that constantly the master is broken. And when the master is broken, Jenkins doesn't build. And when Jenkins doesn't build, the release candidate that gets released on Tuesday doesn't go to KO on Monday. And that means over hours for everybody and a lot of stress, and her manager isn't happy about that, and so on. And finally, of course, because they do weekly releases, releases sometimes tend to get a bit big, and when the release hits production, nobody's really sure anymore what was all in there. Quite typical retrospective outcome, I'd say. Maybe a bit much, but that was to be expected because it was so long ago that the last one. Now, however, Nora has read an article recently on trunkbaseddevelopment.com, um, and she suggests, hey guys, let's do trunk-based development. And everybody looks at her, not really having a clue what is going on. What is this? Is it about people dying and being hit, put into trunks of cars and drove to the river and thrown in there? So she explains that um, currently we're developing features in branches. And when they are ready, we merge them into master. Now, in trunk-based development, we do allow only one branch, the master or the trunk. Everyone commits to the master. Master is deployed to production. It's crucial that head is deployable, is deployable to production at any time. And if the build fails, it must be fixed immediately. She finishes. And then there is the silence that you get in movies sometimes. You know when the hero is running into a room only to find himself surrounded by enemies who are equally surprised with that guy showing up. And then this short second where the enemies haven't, where nobody has realized that there's a fight going to come up, that's it. Now, um, Julio goes first. That's never going to work. 
we will have tons of errors in production and like, I, I won't be responsible for that. That's insane. That's madness. And then Andreas kicks in and he says, well, how, how do we know what we're releasing? I mean, there is, it's going to be complete anarchy. We do not know what we deliver. We do not know what's the current state. And we can't, we can't trust in that, really. Um, then 5.5 points out that code reviews will not really work with that. Because how can they do code reviews? Because there's no pull request, because it's directly going to master. But Nora really believes in it, so um, they all decide to give it a go. That was a Friday when the retrospective was. But then on Monday, um, people you know, come to work and start doing their job programming. And Julio is the first one who finishes a feature. And he started the feature obviously before Friday, so that there's quite a bit of code in that feature. But now there is, uh, is trunk-based development. So he's supposed to just push it to master, right? Right. Pushes to master. Cool, continues. 25 minutes later, he gets a notification in Slack of Jenkins that the build fails. He's a bit curious because that build, I, I'm quite sure I did run, I did run um, Maven clean build locally, didn't I? It should, it should just work. Looks at his shell, he's close to his shell, he can't see if he did build locally anymore, he has to build again. Five minutes later, he knows, nah, actually it's working on my machine, so what on earth is going on? Um, tries to understand the logs from Jenkins, all the five megabytes of it, doesn't really have a clue on what's going on, tries random things. Everybody else, per policy or per, um, per process, is waiting for master to be fixed again because that is a roadblock. And Julio is getting really nervous because every, he feels like everybody's looking at him, he, he's making random commits to try to fix the problem, and it just won't work. And every time he commits something, he has to wait for 25 minutes. Roughly three hours later, master is fixed again. And Julio is quite exhausted and um, happy to go, happy that end of day is coming soon and he can go home. But that's not the only incident. Just two days later, in the evening, Sifo now is finished with his, with his tickets. He's quite late, he's going to, so his wife is out to yoga and he promised her he's going to pick up the kids from kindergarten. And um, the story plays in Germany. Let's assume that for now. I'm not sure how it is in Vienna, but in Germany, at least in Berlin, where I have my three-year-old three -year son in kindergarten, it is very much a big deal that you pick up your kid on time because Germans are really about you know, doing things on time. And if you don't show up exactly one minute before you should be picking up your kid, the insurance of the kindergarten will stop paying if there's any problem or if there's any accident. And the kindergarten teachers will make a big deal of it and they will you know, take all those 30 minutes to explain you in very detail why it's super important that the next time you pick up your kid on time. <laughs> I think, personally, I think kindergarten teachers are big heroes for me. Um, and they're having a lot of stress, and this is actually, a, they're in trouble, but that's, that's the situation. And Sifu doesn't want that. He knows the story. He's heard the story before. Um, but he's, he's pushing. He's got 30 minutes time. He's pushing. Waits. CI builds. 10 minutes, okay, cool. 15 minutes, still, still building, that's good, it's not ready yet. Because by now, like, it couldn't do again because then it's late. 20 minutes, okay, cool, five more minutes. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, red. Build broke. And he's upset because <clears throat> I need to pick up my kids' stupid rules my kids in kindergarten, they're closing. I have to pick it up. I can't, you know, fix this now. This is random. So, and probably it's a failed, probably it's just a, bro, it's just a flaky test, right? Because those tests are sometimes flaky. So it's just that. So basically he thinks, okay, I'm going to trigger, I'm going to just trigger the build again. And it's going to be fine. I'm going to go home, pick up my kid. Um, he does that, goes home, picks up the kid. Obviously he's late. Gets to hear the story. <laughs> Um, next day morning, he comes to the office. Everybody's already there. They look at him, and Andreas goes, you broke the build. You cannot go home with the build broken. What did you do? And Sifo tries to explain himself, but nobody really wants to listen because he obviously broke the rules, and um, ultimately, ultimately, they get the build fixed, and Sifo is a bit grumpy and believes a bit less in trunk-based development, obviously. 
then um, a week after, Julio again, his task is to upgrade a library that's heavily used everywhere, but it's backwards incompatible. And that library basically is touched in 50, 60 places around the whole code base. Um, and he doesn't really know how to do that because it's definitely bigger than one commit, but when he upgrades the library, then the whole build will break, so he has to fix the whole thing at once. And FiFi points out that this feature will just not work with trunk-based development. Trunk-based development is broken by design there because you, don't, you can't just fix that, right? And um, there is a reason why GitHub flow exists. Aren't we putting our money on the wrong horses? Because with GitHub flow, this was never a problem. We had such a situation before. And eventually, they all agree that they're going to make an exception and a one-off branch for that. It just doesn't feel right because basically that's kind of like admitting that you couldn't figure out how to get it done with trunk-based development, isn't it? End of week two, so jumping a couple of days forward, people are pretty motivated. Weekend is coming up, it's Friday afternoon, everybody's packing up the things, having a, last comp, um, having a last beer. Usually that's a bit of a celebration time, but this time it's quite quiet and people head home very early. Because things are more complicated and they are not as nice as they used to be. They used to be a really well-working team. They like each other, they hang out with each other, they have fun with each other. And now they're like constantly in arguments because who broke what and somebody blocked everybody and doesn't feel good anymore. Sifo basically puts it off, says, yeah, I'm paid for that. I'll do what they say. Andreas is a bit more pragmatic, updates his LinkedIn profile. <laughs> <laughs> Adds trunk-based development. <laughs> but yeah, weekend comes, weekend goes. Monday morning, Andreas again meets Fi Fi in the office. They, they have a kitchen. They meet in the kitchen in the morning for a coffee. They were both, of course, complaining a bit about trunk-based development. Andreas points out that the build pipeline is very slow and unstable, very unreliable. And... Um, Pfeiffer thinks, hmm, well, maybe we wanted to improve it ever since anyways. It's been bothering us all the time. Maybe we can do a couple of fixes to improve it. And actually, Andreas is a bit of, uh, is a, bit of a fan of Jenkins. Um, personally, I don't know how somebody can be a fan of Jenkins' job DSL, but he is. Um, and he has a couple of ideas, so he promises to tweak it a bit. Um, but he also says that, you know what, I'd feel much more safe if, we, if I would have confidence that our acceptance tests are actually testing all the important features that may not be broken after a release. If we get those acceptance tests right, then that would really give me some safety. Week three, again, is retrospective. Nora learned her lesson about not doing retrospective like early, like once in a while. And there's been clearly some, there's been clearly some bad blood in the team about you know, like this trunk-based development. Um, in the retrospective, things change, like the tone changed subtly because Andreas's fixes to the build pipeline did actually work and we're now down to 17 minutes, which is cool. He paralyzed a couple of things. He cut off some things that weren't important. He added some caches, some artifacts and so on. So pipeline simpler and faster. And that's a lot, of, that, that's a lot better. Um, also, they, they figured out that somehow and nobody's really sure why, there is less merge conflict. The reason there's less merge conflict is because when you commit more often and you don't, you don't fork away, the number of change coming into the master branch, um, delta is smaller, and when the delta is smaller, the risk of change, obviously, as we all know, with you know, releasing often, smaller releases mean smaller risk of change. Uh, sorry, smaller changes mean smaller risk of release. <laughs> Um, the same applies actually for merge conflicts. Smaller change in the code base um, means smaller risk for merge conflicts. Because if you only work for a short time of period on a subset of, class, of, of files, then the risk that somebody else has touched the files and modified them in a way that they can't be merged automatically is way smaller. So ultimately you get less merge conflicts. Yeah. So Sifo is quite happy because now it's so much simpler and more straightforward to push code to production because he doesn't have to wait for somebody to, a pull, uh, to review the pull request anymore. He doesn't need to fix the changes. He just 
he, he, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a coder who takes a shortcut once in a while, and now he's happy that nobody finds out. Codebase doesn't like it so much, but for him it's, for him it's a bit, bit, of a, bit of a win because um, he doesn't need to fix all the code smells he produces, and that, that's okay. He doesn't frame it that way in the retro, but, but you know. Now, um, they, do, they do take two action items from the build pipeline. First of all, um, this uh, from, the, from the retrospective. First of all, um, they want to make it a bit simpler still. Maybe they can tweak it even more. Maybe they can make it more fast, faster. And they also want to improve their monitoring on production um, to see when, when they release something, if it broke something. So for that, they actually, they're using Elasticsearch log slash Kibana already, which we hopefully all do. But um, the quick fix is to just, in, they have, um, to just put a monitor on a cupboard they have, hook it up with an old computer that nobody uses anymore, and show a dashboard that just shows the histogram of log, um, log entries that have the level error on production over time. And after release, if that, if that increases significantly, they know something's going wrong. That's a pattern they've seen um, before with some applications that when, when a, a faulty release will increase, will always increase the level of lo error log level entries. Which is, by the way, a really cool fix. So I've, I've never seen an application where this is not the case, except for applications that don't do logging at all. Um, but that's, that's really a quick fix. Just looking at them, putting them on a wall on an interactive screen really helps a lot. Um, the next week then brings fresh energy. They have they add some tweaks to the CI pipeline um, to make to make it even faster now. Um, we're now down to 12 minutes, and the team feels like they're getting things under control. However, they are still struggling with commits because you know CIFO is messing around a bit. Everybody sees the code base is growing a bit funny. Code quality seems to get to decrease over time, or actually their automated code checks show that, prove that fact. But they, they don't really yet have an answer to what's, what's going, like how, how to address that issue, what can they do with it. The other problem they still have is, so if I have, if I now I'm supposed to push to master all the time, and I want to push to master frequently, because I don't want to, you know, rely on my laptop's hard drive to contain three weeks worth of work. I want to, you know, put it into version control as quickly as possible so that it's back up, that it's safe, I can go back. Other people can see it. What can I, how can I, how can I get co combine those two things? Because when I, when I push code to the master and master should be deployable to production at any point in time, then I have a half-baked feature that's going live, right? And that's a bit of a tricky one. But Andreas, Andreas suggests that TDD by the book could be an answer. TDD by the book meaning in this case that when you, when you create a class or make a change, actually when you create a new class, let's put it that way, when you create a new class, um, the first thing you do is write the unit test that touches that class and have nothing else touch that class until the class is proven to work. And as long as the class is only executed by the unit test, it's effectively dead code, which means it can go into master, it can be deployed to production because it's basically just a static file that doesn't do anything. It consumes a bit, a bit of hard drive or power disk on the production servers, but not too much. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, it doesn't hurt. And it's quite easy to prove that this does not, this, this, this can't possibly break a thing. Then for features that are actually about, or then for changes that are actually about, about modifying things, feature flags come in handy, which is a technique that's, I think, generally worth thinking about. Feature flags or A-B tests, great concepts. But when you do trunk-based development, having feature flags can help to have one, um, basically have a switch in the code. Think about it as a big if-else block, where the tests for an environment variable or something, some flag being set to true, then only it um, executes the new code. If it's not set to true, it executes the old code. And if that's, for example, an environment variable that doesn't exist on production because it's just you know, a new environment variable that the software engineer has came up with, very easy to be very sure that the code that's in the else block 
is never going to be executed. And if, if you push that behavior actually out into another class on its own, it's on one hand nicely decoupled and nicely isolated. On the other hand, you get good confidence that things do work out. Uh, things will not break, will not break master and or will not change the behavior of the application when deployed to production right now. And FiFi thinks about talking to the product manager um, because they also believe that there is an issue with tickets. Tickets are being quite big. And obviously, a ticket is an atomic work unit that people, that one person works at one point in time. And when the ticket's done, it's done. And if the ticket takes a week, then the change is quite big. So she tries to talk to the product manager and sees if maybe those tickets can be split up a bit better so that, you know, instead of having one huge task, having some subtasks that are all ideally doable in one day. Because also then, it's easier, it's, for one hand, it's easier to parallelize because now in some cases, people can work on a feature in parallel because there's some parts that are not depending on each other. On the other hand, the change, you know, the change is done much quicker and can be pushed without feature flags much quicker. And in some cases, it isn't even necessary to have a feature flag or do TDD, which, by the way, C4 likes a lot, not having to do TDD. And that, that's maybe just easier, right? They also make an important observation. So coming from, coming from um, being afraid to do the release, because we don't know what's in there, it's going to be likely to, it's going to be likely to explode. Re releases are now a relief. Because a release means I don't need to worry about it anymore. Because a small change is unlikely to break. And once it's released, it's proven I don't need to care. It's not going to come back to me at the next release day and bite me in the butt. It just, it's, just, it's just out there. It's working. That's checked and cool. Yes, maybe there's still a bug once in a while. But the change is smaller, so it's less likely. One of the coolest parts about a trunk-based development, in my opinion, is that fact that releases become a relief and not a burden. Um, and then another week later, the team has another, uh, sorry, three weeks later, because things are better, so they increase the interval. The team has another retrospective. And that one is slightly different. They're happy. Because Sifo realized that he gets less interrupted by code reviews and bug reports. Nora realizes, hey, wow, our lead time improved a lot. We can ship a code change within half a day normally. That's a great success for, for business. That's really, that, that's really helping me on my performance rep, uh, review. That's helping me get a, get a promotion and a bonus and everything. And she's happy. Andreas is very happy because he's confident that the regression tests are working and that he has a good sense of quality in the, in the whole project, in the whole path from git push to production. And Julio is happy because there wasn't a rollback or hotfix in the last two weeks. Because changes are smaller, less likely to break. Um, still, they haven't really still tackled the problem of code reviews, which is a hard one to tackle in trunk-based development. But they think that maybe doing more pair programming could help a lot. So they all agree to try to do more pair programming, which is a practice I can like recommend in any case only, but maybe, that, maybe that's the way around it. Um, and the second takeaway, they think it's time for a team event. And while um, our team is partying the night away, let's have a look at what happened. So that's the phases of grief that I mentioned before. Um, big change coming, we're doing trunk-based development. People were like, that's not going to work. I don't care. I'm just going to continue as as used to, which didn't work out. They broke the build. Um, Sifu got to learn about the story why it's important to pick up kids from the kindergarten, and so on. Then they started discussing about why it's not a good idea, why they need to go back, because it's, it's a model that used to work in the past, and now there's a lot of cases that prove it's wrong. And then they just basically gave up. They were like, whatever, I'm paid for it, I'd update my LinkedIn profile, until they that magic weekend when they realized it, it's there to stay. It's not going to go away. I've got, to, I've got to live with it. I've got to deal with it. Then they started thinking about, OK, what can we do to, to make it better? Realizing, hey, fixing the build, improving the build pipeline is actually helping a lot. Um, 
they started adopting some of the principles. Mm. So adding, doing test driven development. And then ultimately realizing the potential. Go to production quicker, having less errors, being able to move faster. And then one last thought. Maybe now you're thinking that's beautiful thoughts for beautiful minds, but that doesn't apply to me. And I don't think that this model, trunk-based development or head development, if you, wanna, if you use Git and want to call it something else, um, works for every case. Especially if you are working in the bank where I have my bank account, please don't use it. But this is a model that works great um, when two conditions are met. First condition, you value speed over safety. So again, not a bank, maybe a startup, maybe a company where it is okay to be down once in a while, where the, there is not an SLA of 100%, but there is a, just three nines SLA, or there, it's okay to fail, there is not, if the application fails, this is not traumatic. So I come, I, I said before, I come from classifieds. If, class, if, if a classifieds website is down, it's not the end of the world, let's face it. Nobody dies, nobody loses money, except for the company itself, but you know, the bigger picture, it's not very dramatic. If you do value safety over speed, then this is probably not a good idea, because then you are, sometimes you are in a highly regulated environment where there's certain measurements you need to do, like code reviews, and there's more quality gates you can install when you have more um, breaks on the way to pushing some code to, on making a change. The other thing is that this only works if um, the circle of trust equals the circle of committers. Example for this not being the case is open source project. The circle of trust is all the maintainers, all the open source, pro all the leads of that project, like on Apache Software Foundation, the, the core contributors. Everybody else that makes a pull request to any open source project who's not part of the main group is not in the circle of trust. If I have an open source project, anybody can and should make a pull request, but it doesn't mean I trust it and just say, hey, come in, give me your, give me your beautiful um, security things, that, like, you know, give me your beautiful scam or whatever, I need to have a look at it. If that's the case, not a good idea, because you lose control over, you lose control over what is going in being harmful or not. It's much harder, because it's... Um, you can only check it once it's in. You can't keep, there's no gate to keep it out. But then on the other hand, it makes things a lot simpler. We don't need to build pull request when we are done with a feature and wait for a pull request to be done. We don't need that pull request to be, you know, we don't need to poke some dear colleague, hey, can you review my pull request? Hey, can you review my pull request? And then, hey, what do you mean? Come on, that code is perfectly fine. Uh, what the? No, this, this goes away. We don't have those discussions anymore. It's much leaner and quicker. And the process of getting to trunk-based development, which is very important, it changes so many things. It shakes things up. And when things, shakes, uh, when things shakes up, bottlenecks and blockers become visible. The team realized by the pain they got from their 25-minute build pipeline that their build pipeline is actually a big problem. So they fixed it. Then they had other problems. They, they, got, they, they, became, they became more, more apparent and um, they were fixed. It's a bit in line with this agile mantra of if it hurts, do it more often, which is a bit, of de which is a bit debatable, but I think in, in software development, it, it does work quite often. It doesn't work with um, high fives that go into the face, but um, let's leave them aside. But that's pretty much the idea. We have 10 minutes more for questions, and I'm really looking forward to those. Once the questions are done, I have a couple of goodies. And I would really prefer if I don't have to bring them back to Berlin, because every piece here that goes into my suitcase is a couple less mana schnitten that I can bring back. <laughs> so looking forward for your questions. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I just peeked. There are a couple of questions. Can we pull on the questions? So one question that I want to, to ask up front is, um, let's talk about size, about size of teams. Let's imagine having 120 developers working on UI code, same code base. Uh, how does this work when, when a huge crowd of people is committing to the same trunk, to the same master branch? Then you, you, get, you quickly get into the problem of a circle of trust versus circle of committers there. You know, if you, if you are a company of 
couple of hundreds or thousands of software engineers, can you trust everybody to, like, can you trust every single person to really not break any single component? I mean, there might be more unexperienced developers and there might be code that is highly concurrent and thus bring a couple of potential concurrency issues. Do you really want to trust everybody to, to do that? Maybe not so much a good idea. But then on the other hand, there is Facebook and Google. I'm not sure if they're both still doing it, but until recently, they've both been doing exactly this. The, they had just one single repository for all Facebook. I think Google's pretty much the same, or was the same. And everybody was just pushing to master. And maybe it stopped working for them at one point, but you know what stopped working for Google five years ago will never stop working for us. Would be right. my answer. But definitely for small teams, it is a real quick win that is like for bigger teams, I think there's a lot of tricky questions to answer. I think so. Mr. Slido, man, can you please cancel the third questions I just asked that? Thank you very much. Um, other question, uh, as we see on the wall, uh, um, uh, code reviews. So um, you just said code reviews. You, you just completely forget code reviews. You do rather pair programming. Um, is, there, is there another way to, to, to share uh, uh, what's happening with other people in your team? Uh, pair programming is just two of them. There's exactly, not a couple yeah. of them. So the circle of trust needs to be informed mm. what happens in the code base. There is, I think there's a couple of ways. It's, um, I think that's the trickiest question. What do we do with code reviews? Because the answer is, there, isn't, there is no, no real good answer about how to deal, what's the, how do we make code reviews work. Knowledge exchange gets a bit trickier, especially in bigger teams. Like, I don't know how Facebook or Google was able to do it. I think it's more about collaboration then, then so that you have, you have a team that's helping each other that where people feel they can ask a question at any point in time. If you have a good, good team culture, people will help each other and show each other around and support each other. I think that's probably the, the more important aspect than actually reading the code, I would say, because what you care about is understanding the concept and not every single if statement would be my answer. All right, so then let's go to the, to the last question. Uh, um, and it's also the latest question. So you consider it to be uh, not a big deal if a service goes down. So I, I work in, in a company whose whole purpose is to make sure services are not going down because it's a huge deal for a lot of people, especially if you are in a startup. Uh, you know, service goes down, that's mm. like we don't earn that much money and now we earn nothing mm. at, at all. Any safety nets, any, any, anything that can help you uh, uh, shipping around this having, problem. Having a good deployment is one thing. So, I mean, we're living now in a time of Kubernetes becoming a commodity and function as a service. And then there is strategies around, you know, shifting 1% of traffic to the new one or test just, you know, having, being able to look at the next production version before it gets put to production. Those things might, those things might work out. Um, but ultimately, whatever you do, there is not a 100% strong guarantee that your, your service will not go down post-release. That just doesn't exist. Even if you follow all the things, then there might be one edge case that's super crazy that takes the service down. Or it's one case where somebody found a double, a double number that when sent as a header into Java applications or almost all applications would cause Java to go into an endless loop and completely shut down. What, how do you, like, you, want, you want to exclude that one. Um, I think there is also about, it's also about, you know, when you have microservices, how do you, do you, do you have good measures to ensure that when one service goes down, not everything goes down? Which is anything, in any case, you know, um, um, wire, damn it, I lost the word, wire, um, circuit, circuit breakers. Yeah. You want to do it in many ways, regardless what you do, because microservices do have the tendency to go down once in a while. And being able to fall back can be a safety net. All right. All right, so, uh, and with that, I want to say thank you. Uh, this concludes today. I think the, if there are more questions to Matthias about this controversial approach of, of uh, coding, I guess he'll stay here for much longer for your questions. And with that, I say we go from trunk-based development to drunk-based development and have a great evening. So thank you for staying with me. Thank you for the second day of your developers. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.